Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and as Nadia said, um, the commitment of the school system uh, really runs throughout this room today. Uh, as Nadia said, we have members of our senior staff, many members of the school committee are here. This is an integral part of, of, uh, of what we do each and every day. Um, Nadia thanked a number of people, so I won't go through those same things again. It's such a pleasure to see you again to have had the opportunity to work with you on this program for so many years. And Jackie, we so appreciate everything that you do, both within this program and really within everything that we do in the public schools, our early ed program, the work you allow our senior staff and uh, principals to do here on campus, um, the college and true partner of the school system, and we appreciate it very much. Um, this is a unique partnership. So Nadia sent me a note that said, make sure you talk about the unique partnership. And, and, I, don't think, and I don't think that a number of us who have been involved in the, in the board process, I'm looking particularly at Rebecca Stone from our, from our school committee, until we sat down about a year ago to really start putting the, the board of directors concept together, I don't think we knew exactly what that meant and what that would look like. But it is a truly unique partnership um, that serves our students and really has a number of people from all different quarters of this town and this community coming together around what's really important and that is the success of our kids. Um, and so I want to thank each of you for the role that you play in that because there are so many people here today that have played and continue to play such an important role in the success of those students um, throughout our school system and what they're able to accomplish both in the time that they're with us and now that we're seeing such tremendous success as they venture out um, to, to the logical next steps for them, whether it be college or the workforce. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about those students because those of you who have come to these before know that that's what I do at these, um, is talk about our students. Uh, our students in this program and throughout our school system are amazing. I've said before, and, and it never gets old for me to say that that this group of students are some of my most tremendous advisors. Uh, Dr. Fisher Mueller and I have spent much time with students talking about programs at the high school. I love a number of things about them, among them that they will always tell us what they think about our programs. Right? I can recall many stories where people, have, where students have said to us, I'll bet you think this program is accomplishing this, and then essentially, why don't you think again? <laughs> because you need to look at this differently. It's not actually working in the way that you think it's working. And we've made a number of significant program modifications because of the work of those advisors, of those student advisors over the years. Um, and I love their energy. I, I guess I love in particular that unlike many students that I meet, including my own children, they're able to talk about what's working and not working for them and how they're going about planning to make changes to their pursuit of particular academic goals or in terms of the work that they're doing in classes. And like Nadia, I really attribute that not only to all of our teachers that work in, in particular in the system, because I think we have teachers in the system that are second to none, but in particular to the people that work with the students through the STEPS program each and every day, the advisors who are back there, um, who do such a tremendous job in advising these students from the very beginnings of their time in the program through the time that they graduate and now beyond. So thank you. And thank you, thanks to all of you for your support and for being here today and for your support of our vision of what we're trying to accomplish in the public schools. Thanks.
Um, and thanks to all of you for being here. It is exciting uh, for me to be <coughs> a part of this conversation uh, about my book and about staff to success. Um, it is, I think, a really important organization doing a lot of the work that uh, I've been so fascinated by over the past few years. And so uh, I'm looking forward to having a conversation to get a little bit into a little bit more detail about how uh, what I've been writing about connects with the work that uh, you all have been doing. Um, one other person I want to thank before I start, and that is my editor, Deanna Hermy, um, who is study finds that if you take a group, any group of adults, 
the ones who've experienced significant amounts of trauma in childhood. They have uh, heart disease rates that are twice as high as normal, cancer rates that are twice as high, <coughs> emphysema rates that are four times as high, suicide rates that are 12 times as high. And what we now understand is that the mechanism behind that phenomenon is <coughs> stress. There are a lot of important systems being developed in the brains and bodies of young children but one of the most important, and until recently, one of the least well understood is our stress response system. Every child experiences stress. Um, you know, a baby gets sad or scared or lonely, and she cries and wails, and then somebody picks her up and comforts her. And for most babies, that, that cycle is actually a positive experience. You know, we're not terribly damaging our kids when they cry. For most of them, you know, that's actually kind of good exercise for the stress response system. But the problem comes when kids are facing stress that is not mild and occasional, but that is chronic and intense, what doctors sometimes call toxic stress. And toxic stress doesn't help to build up our stress response system. Instead, it damages it. And, and that damage gets right under our skin, and it can last a lifetime. We can see its effects on our physical health, on our mental health, and also on the development of this crucial set of attention and concentration skills that matters so much in school, from the first day of kindergarten all the way to the end of graduate school. So that was one part of the research that I wrote about uh, in my book. Uh, another part is the psychological research about character strengths, things like optimism and self-control and conscientiousness. Um, and there are researchers around the country who are, are trying to study these, what often seem like very um, vague and esoteric ideas, to try to figure out where what the roots of One of the people who I spent the most time with um, was a psychological researcher at the University of Pennsylvania named Angela Duckworth. And Angela was interesting to me in part because during the years that I've been writing about her, her focus has shifted. She started off being very much concerned about self-control. And there's a lot of good and important research out there, some of which she's done, some of which others have done, that show that self-control in children is really important. It's a, a highly um, positive predictor of good outcomes in adulthood. Angela did this one study when she was just a, a graduate student in psychology where she took a group of middle school students and she gave them at the beginning of the year two tests, one a basic IQ test and the other um, an evaluation of their self-control ability. And then she looked at their GPAs at the end of the year and she found that their self-control score at the beginning of the year was a better predictor than their IQ of what their GPA would be at the end of the year. This was a pretty striking conclusion, sort of went against a lot of what we believe education uh, is all about. Uh, and so for a while, she kind of became this guru of self-control at 10. But then she started to feel like there was something missing in this idea of self-control. You know, self-control is all really about not doing things. You know, it's about delaying gratification and um, staying focused on tasks and, and not getting distracted. And it's not really the kind of skill that allows someone to start a great software company or even found a great rock band. And so she wanted to try to name this more entrepreneurial ability that she was thinking of. And she came up with this idea of grit. And grit to her still has a lot of self-discipline in it, but it also involves passion. The way she defines grit is perseverance and pursuit of a passion. So the kids who have grit are the ones who have a very clear goal in mind, and they don't let any obstacle get in the way of that goal. And Angela's actually come up with this grit test, this deceptively simple little 12-question test you can find on her website at Pan. And you know, the questions are things like, how often do you start one project and then get distracted and move on to another? But what she's found is that there's two remarkable things about these questions. One is that people are actually pretty honest when they answer the question. They'll actually tell you how gritty they are. And the, the other is that your grit score turns out to predict a lot of important outcomes for kids. She gave it to freshmen at Penn for tests, uh, and it predicted how well they do in that first year. She gave it to students in the National Spelling Bee, and it predicted how far they would progress. Um, most remarkably, she gave it to uh, cadets at West Point as they were entering this grueling summer program called Beast Barracks, and it predicted who would make it through Beast Barracks even better than the Army's own official candidate score that they'd always used in the past mm -hmm. to figure out who was going to succeed, who wasn't. Um, so that psychological research is another part of what I've been writing about. And then the third strain of my reporting was about educational interventions, about different interventions that were trying to, um, trying to affect these character strengths and trying to counter the sort of um, the effects of toxic strengths and growing up in, in those sorts of 
had this new experimental collaboration around character education. One school was the Kit Infinity Charter School, which is a middle school in West Harlem that serves a mostly low-income population. The other was the Riverdale Country School, one of the most exclusive private schools in New York City. Tuition just topped $42,000 a year. The good news is pre-K is still just $41,000. <laughs>
that is focused on taking kids who are uh, heavily disadvantaged from usually working at the studying at underperforming schools and getting them not just to college but through college. Uh, so it's a three-year program. Uh, it's a, a, a credit-bearing course in junior and senior years of high school, and then it's an advisory um, function in the freshman year of college. Um, and a lot of what they do, part of what they do, is they, they talk about um, a roadmap to college. They give these students who are, I think, exclusively first-generation uh, college students, no one in their family has gone to college. They give them the kind of roadmap to college, a uh, clear set of um, information, an understanding about how college works, how do you apply, how you apply for financial aid, how you choose the right colleges to apply to, how you get along with a, with a um, roommate and professors once you get to college. But the other thing that they do is really focus on non-cognitive skills. They call them leadership principles. Um, things like integrity and resilience and resourcefulness. And so throughout junior and senior year, they're talking to these students about these skills and saying, these are skills that you already have growing up in the neighborhoods where you're growing up. Just getting to school every day, you need vast amounts of resilience and resourcefulness, ambition. Um, but what we want to help you do is focus those skills on this one particular goal graduating from college. So far, they're still pretty early on. Most of their uh, students, their, their furthest along students are sophomores and juniors in college now. But so far, their numbers are really promising, pretty similar to what success, success numbers are. Um, and their hope is that these kids are going to graduate at much higher rates than what the students in, um, in Chicago public schools are doing in general. I want to close by just talking about this, this thought that I have about uh, kids and disadvantage and how this research is, is particularly relevant to them. Well, I find all this research about brain chemistry, um, you know, about how toxic stress affects the development of the brain to be really important and fascinating. That's why I wrote about it in the book. Um, but I think that there is a risk in writing about it and talking about it the way that I've done. And that is that I worry that it can make us feel complacent or fatalistic. The neurochemistry, when you start to study it, just seems so powerful that we can't imagine that any child who grows up in that sort of environment, surrounded by toxic stress, without uh, the kind of secure attachment with a parent that we know helps brain development so much, we can't imagine that those kids could ever go on to real success. And yet, of course, uh, as everyone in this room knows, there are those success stories out there that happen um, all the time. And there are a few that I write about in my book. There's this one young woman who I think about a lot uh, named Kiwana Lerma. When I met her a few years ago, she was a junior in high school, in a low-performing uh, high school on the south side of Chicago. And Kiwana had just about as difficult a childhood as we would ever wish on anybody. She grew up in deep poverty. She had a family that was unstable and chaotic. She was homeless for a while as a child. She had a, a mother who cared about her very much, but found it difficult to give Kiwana the support and so Kiwana reacted to this upbringing the way a lot of kids do, which is that it made her upset and angry. And she brought that anger with her to school every day. In her sixth grade year, she was sent to the principal's office 72 times. Uh, and they eventually put her in the slow class at her school. And this was one of those schools where the slow class was just a place to warehouse problem kids. You know, they just gave them popcorn and let them watch movies, and no one really tried to teach them anything. And so Kiwana fell further and further behind. And yet when I met her as a junior in high school, she was in the middle of this remarkable personal transformation. She got from having a, a 1.5 GPA in her freshman year of high school to being a straight A student focused on college. So I followed her through her senior year of high school, her and her class, uh, as she was applying to colleges. And it was a struggle all the way along because her standardized test scores um, were never very good. Her, her best ACT score was a 15 which put her in the bottom fifth of all students nationwide. But she worked so hard at school that she had a great GPA, and that GPA uh, helped her get to a good college, Western Illinois University. And when she finished her freshman year, she had, uh, well, let me say it before I tell you this, how she finished her freshman year. When she got there, you know, she, she was well behind, despite all the work that she'd done at her school. I think she was behind pretty much everyone else in, in her freshman class. But she worked incredibly hard. She was very resourceful, figured out ways to connect with professors who sat in the front row of every class, um, went up to professors, asked them after class to explain what she hadn't understood. And she caught up to a remarkable degree just in her freshman year. And at the end of her freshman year, her GPA was a 3.8, uh, which had her coming close to the top of her class. Um, and she's now just finished her sophomore year, and she's determined to finish in four years, still having a lot of struggles, still meeting a lot of obstacles, uh, but determined to so my hope is that this research 
like he wants can sometimes you know, be very moving and inspiring. Um, but I think they can also sometimes leave us feeling a little bit empty because we don't really know how they happen. You know, they seem so rare and random. And what is exciting to me about this research is that I feel like for the first time we're coming to understand the science of how Kiwana became Kiwana, you know, how the environment in which she grew up got her so completely off track. But then how the interventions and the support that she received got her so firmly back on track. And so I think if we want to find ways that more kids like you want are gonna succeed, create a system where these success stories are no longer so rare and random, we need some new solutions. You know, that there are not, I think, uh, great ways out there to help kids who are growing up and deep advantage succeed in the way we want them to succeed to graduate from college in much higher numbers. So that is exactly why I'm so excited by the work that Steps to Success is doing. Because I think they, you are looking at exactly the right outcome, how to get kids through college, and starting at the right place as well, starting early, and recognizing that this is not something, um, despite you want success, that this is not something where we should be starting in uh, junior year of high school. It's something where the, the interventions and support have to start a lot earlier. Um, so I thank you for the work that you're doing with this organization, and thanks for hearing me out. I'd love to answer any questions.
got to school early, she um, sat in the front row of every class. She would make notes uh, in, in her notebook that her hardest class was biology. And there was a lot she realized that she just didn't understand that the professor was saying words that he was using. So she would put a red dot in her notebook beside every word that she didn't understand. And then she'd go up after the class to the professor and say, you know, with her piece of paper covered with red dots, and said, can you explain these ideas to me a little bit better? And to her professor's credit, um, the professor said yes. And basically, I think, you know, we sort of reteach each lecture over again to Kiwana and help her through this. Um, and so it's a great credit to the professor that he did that, but I think it's even more of a credit to Kiwana. Uh, that that's a really difficult thing to say for anyone, especially a teenager, um, to say, you know, I don't know as much as everyone else in this classroom. I need more help. Um, but Kiwana was incredibly gifted, I think, as being able to do that. And I think that the support that she got from one goal helping to help her to understand how to train that resourcefulness on this particular um, goal that she had uh, was a big part of what was important. Uh, any other questions? Yes? So rumor has it that you have this on? Yes. Um, what are the most important things you would like to see this school do to help you know, that this class take succeed? Uh, so I have a four-year-old son named Ellington, and he just, uh, so when I started working on this book, it was just by the time that he was born, uh, the first page of the book talks about his birth. Um, and so at, during the years that I was working on this, it was sort of his you know, zero to three years, it was just as he was going through a lot of this early childhood brain development that I was writing that. Um, and so I've, I've, I've thought a lot over the years about how his growth connects with the things I was writing about in the book. And uh, he just started pre-kindergarten. I live in a town called Montauk at the end of Long Island. Uh, and there's one school in Montauk. Um, so that's the school that he just started. It built it. It's a pre-K through eight school, so he'll be there for 10 years. Uh, so it's a pretty daunting moment for me. Um, I think more daunting for me than for him. Uh, that first day of school, just realizing that you know, this was the beginning of his official education. Um, and so I thought, about, thought a lot about what I hope that that school gives him. And I guess I would say there are two things that I think about. One is that um, I hope that they're able to find a, <clears throat> a balance between these two sets of skills. You know, I, 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 I do actually care whether he learns to read and count and things like that. Um, I do think that those cognitive skills matter a lot. Um, and so I hope that the, those are things that he learns in school as well as out of school. But I do think, uh, but I do care very much as well about this other set of skills. And I think right now, a lot of schools don't have the infrastructure in place to figure out how to help develop them. And I think a lot of schools, uh, especially public schools, uh, are under pressure from the federal government on down to focus increasingly on test scores. Um, the, the way that our federal education policy has gone over the past 12, 13 years has been very much focused um, on giving all of the incentives to teachers and to schools and to school systems uh, around those test scores. Um, and so I hope that they can resist that a little bit and, and think a bit more broadly. The one other thing that I'll say um, that I haven't quite figured out my thinking about, but, but in terms of thinking about what I hope that school gives him, uh, is that, so as it's a public school, Montauk is a pretty well off town, but there is um, a sizable um, Hispanic population and low income population, and those two groups mostly overlap. So there's some kids in his class uh, who don't speak English yet, really, at all. Um, and Ellington speaks English a lot. <laughs> and, um, and so already, you know, here's a four-year-old, and already, you know, I know, knowing the research that, that, I, that I've uh, spent a lot of time looking at, I know that they're, um, those kids have challenges uh, that Ellington doesn't have. And um, without a lot of support early on, I think it's going to be difficult for them to um, keep up with Ellington. Um, and, and, I, and so this is sort of a new idea for me. You know, I'm, I'm, the first four years as I've been thinking about him, you know, in, in uh, daycare and in nursery school and at home with me and his mother, um, I've been thinking just about like how I help Ellington do better and how help him develop the skills that he needs. Um, but now, seeing him in this class of the kids from our town, all the, the four-year-olds from Montauk, um, I feel like um, I want to make sure that all these kids succeed uh, and that, that his success, I think, Without, without their success, his success, which I feel more confident about, um, will, will not mean as much somehow. And I think, I think it will diminish his success in that. Um, so I haven't figured out exactly how to, how to deal with that feeling um, and how to influence that. And I think that you know, that's a lot of I think, what people in Brooklyn are thinking about as well, how to, um, through steps to success, um, how to improve the outcomes for every child in this city. Um, there are some kids here, just as there are some kids in Montauk who are on a, a very clear path to success, um, and others 
So, I mean, the, the first thing I'll say is just about Tijuana. Like, I, I give her mom a lot of credit for that moment, um, absolutely, and just for everything she's done for Tijuana. Um, but, you know, to be honest, she's not an exemplary mom in terms of helping Tijuana succeed. Um, she, you know, continues to um, struggle with, with a lot of things in life, and, and for the most part, she, um, I think, has held, held Tijuana back as much as she's helped her to be honest. Um, so I do think Tijuana is an example of how the right amount of support outside of um, the home and in school um, kids can succeed despite not having that kind of support from home. Absolutely, I think when kids, well, I'd say two things. One is I think you're right, there are also kids who have less support than you want to have. Um, and, uh, but I think it's important to, and I think when kids have more support, it's a lot easier for them. Um, so I think, I think there are two things that schools and, and communities can take um, away from, from what we know about the relationship between parental involvement and school success. One is that I think we can't depend on parental involvement, right? We, we can't say that, that there's no way to succeed without it because there are just some kids who are not going to be able to solve that problem for them. Some parents just aren't prepared to give their kids the sort of help that they need. Uh, and so I think it means the schools need to find ways to compensate for that, to, to give more support to the kids who aren't getting it at home and to, to But then I also think that there's a lot that um, we can do in school systems and beyond school systems to support parents better. Um, and in lots of ways, I think Kiwana's mom is a good example. You know, Kiwana's mom, when I, like, there's a lot of, in all the communities where I've done supporting, there's sometimes complaints about how parents you know, don't show up at report card night or PTA meetings and that, right? And I agree, those numbers, if those numbers were higher, it would certainly make things but then when I think about like Juana's own mom and how what her experience of school was like, you know, school building for her is just was a place of um, humiliation, bad feelings, um, constantly constantly being reminded how she wasn't measuring up. Uh, and so to ask her to come back into that building and sit in a room where she might again hear a lot of the same messages about how she wasn't doing enough, you know, reading with her kids, she needed to be more involved. That's that's a big ask. You know, that's a really difficult. And so I think there's a lot more that most schools and school systems can do to help make that easier for parents, to go into parents' homes, to uh, reach out to them with resources, to connect with them um, on an emotional level, uh, and psychological level, as well as just on an academic level, to say, you know, we want to support you through this. We want to help you help your kids succeed. It's a difficult conversation to have because it's, um, you know, it can be very touchy. If it's done insensitively, I think it can make parents feel worse rather than better. Uh, but I think if we can find the right way to do that, I think we can really, um, we can make a big difference for how well kids do. Uh, I think we should have only one more question. Uh, okay, great. I don't, I don't know. How about you? Okay. <laughs> During the school days, you say, you know, they're concentrating so much on this, these test scores and trying to make sure that their schools don't lose funding. Um, and so sometimes there's not time to focus on some of these other pieces. So I'm interested in hearing about what you saw in terms of some of the partnerships that can happen with, you know, so programs like One Goal, which are not, which are outside of the school. Um, and if you saw other programs that use, you know, things like college students to do some of the work in partnership with schools, if you saw any of that, or what role you could see from that taking to help make sure the students get this well-rounded experience. I think those partnerships are really important. Uh, and I think so, some of them certainly can happen within schools. I think there are, there are a lot of communities that are, um, I guess I'm focused on now so I'm thinking about college, that are, are uh, working within schools to help um, students with the college application process. It seems like in, in most uh, public high schools, especially in low-income communities, um, the guidance counselors, uh, there's just not enough resources there in the guidance office to help students just even figure out how to apply to college, let alone um, take all the steps that, you know, uh, upper 
where the bureaucracy is so um, uh, resistant to change that they don't want to accept that help and make the kind of accommodations that they need to. Uh, but when it happens, I think great things can change. Um, yes, last question. Do you, think, uh, do you think grit is a skill that can be taught, or do you think that a child is born with it? Uh, so the question is, do I think that grit is uh, a skill that can be taught, or is a child born with it? So, um, you know, I, I do think that some of grit and all these other character strengths is something uh, are matters of temperament. Some they're they're in heart and innate. But a lot of the premise, really, of my book, and of a lot of the um, work that Angela Duckworth and uh, Dave Levin and Kip and others are doing, is to say that that no, that mostly these are these are skills that we can learn, that we can be better at. There's this um, the concept I write about in the book called the growth mindset, based on this. Psychologist at Stanford University named Carol Dweck. One of the things that she found is one of the best predictors of which students succeed and which don't uh, is their, their opinion about this obscure question about the malleability of intelligence. If you think that people can make themselves smarter, um, you have a growth mindset. And if you think that our, our brains are more, more or less set and they don't change very much, you have a fixed mindset. And kids who have a fixed mindset. Um, tend to do worse in school for kids who have a growth mindset and that continues into adulthood, regardless of their IQ. If you just think that you can change your IQ, whether or not you actually can, you tend to do better. You deal better with failure, um, you try harder, you work more. And a lot of the idea behind uh, all of the work that I wrote about, Angela Duckworth's work and uh, what Kip is doing and Riverdale is doing, is that they're trying to take that growth mindset idea and transplant <laughs> it from intelligence say to kids that even in these qualities that can seem so innate, things like you know, our curiosity or our self-control, that a lot of us, I think, believe are things that we're just born with or we're not, that in fact these are skills.